Amen. Are you guys ready for the word tonight? All right. Well, I am. And uh, so if you would like to get ahead, we're going to be going to the book of Exodus in a moment. And tonight we are continuing with our, uh, with our series. And the series is entitled, My Favorite Bible Characters and What I Have Learned from Them. And so tonight we're going to look at another Bible character and we're going to draw some truth. Uh, if, if you have studied the Bible very much, you know that God has put stories and accounts of people's lives, what they've gone through, the things that have happened to them, and how God interacted with them to bring them to some, you know, to, to, to his conclusion. And so looking at these Bible characters and learning from their lives what some of them did and what some of them didn't do. The, by the way, both of those lessons are very valuable. Sometimes God puts people in our lives to teach us what to do. And sometimes he puts people in our lives to teach us what not to do. As I said, both of these lessons are very valuable. And let me encourage you uh, tonight to look at the life of one lady that we're going to look at. And uh, tonight we are in the 11th Bible character that we uh, have shared together. And tonight our Bible character is Joshebed. Who in the world is Joshebed? Well, we're going to look at who Joshebed is in a moment. Well, just to get you a little bit ahead of the game. uh, This is the lady who married Amram. Now, does that help? Yeah. (laughs) Who was Amram? Who knows who Amram was? Well, Amram um, was, was, I'm going to give you a little tidbit. This sounds, you know, it sounds kind of, it sounds odd. And it is odd in today's culture, in today's society. Uh, But the Bible tells us the truth. One of the things I like about God's word is it doesn't really try to hide things. And sometimes when you read something, you wonder, why in the world did God put that in there? And, uh, you know, I've wrestled for a number of years uh, about sharing some things that are in the Bible because it gets people thinking in a different direction. But uh, let me just go ahead and share this little behind the scenes tidbit about Joshebed and Amram. Joshebed was Amram's aunt. He married his father's sister. Okay, isn't that interesting? So not only is Joshebed the mother of Moses, but she's also his great aunt. <laughs> okay, boy, that doesn't, you know, Whoa, this is amazing, right? Is it amazing to you? Do you like the, I mean, it's not really a behind the scenes thing. I mean, the Bible says, you know, I mean, in the sixth chapter of of Exodus, it says, you know, that, that Moses was born to a man named Amram who married his father's sister, Joshebed. Okay, well, anyway, I'll move on. Okay, I know someone out there is going, wow. Okay, let me do some more Bible study. I hope it provokes you to Bible study because whenever we go to the word of God, I mean, you you, you know, you just can't make this stuff up. This stuff is good. It's amazing. It's wonderful. And almost anything that you are experiencing in life or someone else has experienced in life, you can read about it in the Bible. Interesting, huh? Well, let me catch us up on the historical uh, uh, perspective and a little bit of what was going on in Egypt around the time and just, uh, just, just, just what was happening and bring us into the situation to the first and second chapter of Exodus. Uh, it's about the year 1580 BC, 1580 years before Christ. The children of Israel, by the time we get to the first chapter of Exodus, the children of Israel had been in Egypt for a little over 350 years. Actually, by about 360 years that they had been there in Egypt. Well, uh, uh, it had been generations since Jacob, the patriarch whom God named Israel, it, 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 it had been, you know, generations since Jacob had taken 70 members of his family down into Egypt. 
He had been invited by Pharaoh, you know, by, 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 the, by the leader of this great empire. He had been invited, bring your, your, your family here. And so 70 of, the, of, of, of you know, Jacob and 70 of his family members, all of his family members, went down into Egypt. But it had been generations since then. And they had grown from 70 people. By some accounts, there were 600,000. By other accounts, there were 2 million it really may depend on how they calculated the census. Sometimes they calculated the census on how many men who were able to go to war, okay? So there, you know, some people imagine there were 600,000 men that were capable of going to war, basically between the age of 20 and 50 is how they calculated it. Uh, but some imagine, uh, you know, that that 600,000 represent everyone. But others imagine there were already 2 million. Whether it's 600,000 or whether it's 2 million, that's quite a number of people that over 350 years had come from Jacob and his 70 people that he took down into Egypt. Well, it had been by this time, by the time we get to Exodus chapter 1, it had been about 300 years since Joseph had died. And generation after generation, they had lost favor. The children of Israel had lost favor with the Pharaohs and they had lost favor with, therefore, with the children of, of or the, the, the Egyptians. And so they had become, you know, uh, uh, just nothing more than, than just considered as slave labor to the Egyptians. In the year prior, uh, the years rather, uh, just a few decades prior to the birth of Moses, the Bible says that a new king came on the scene. And this new leader of the Egyptian empire, uh, he developed some real problems. He became more and more uh, you know, uh, uh, suspicious. He became more and more protective. He became uh, increasingly concerned about the Hebrew population. He became more and more concerned that, that they were growing and increasing in numbers so that they were outnumbering the population of the Egyptians. And the king decided that he was going to develop a strategy whereby he could protect himself, his kingdom, his hierarchy. He could protect the status quo. He could protect the Egyptians. And uh, so the king decided uh, that what he needed to do in order to protect the Egyptians from the Hebrew slaves and the increase and the strength, the Bible says that they were more powerful and they were more in number than the Egyptians. We'll read that in a moment. What what he decided to do was to control their birth rate. Okay? Now, I know this may seem like a page out of recent history, but this is 1,580 years before Christ. Let me tell you, the devil has no new material. Okay? He only has old material. He divide, uh, the king decided to develop a strategy to control the number of children born to this undesirable group of people that he wanted to limit their strength and their abilities. What was his plan? Free late term abortions paid for by the state. Boy, that was good. Slipped right in there, didn't it? Didn't that just slip out? Whoa, y'all, y'all say that? That's slick anywhere. But that's the truth. That is exactly what Pharaoh decided to do in his strategy to keep himself on the top of the heap and to keep his, his, uh, you know, his ruling class on the top is that we will offer free, not just offer, it, it came to the place where he demanded free late-term abortions paid for by the state, i.e. paid for by taxes. In other words, the king of Egypt came up with this idea. He wasn't the first one to come up with it, and he wouldn't be the last one to come up with it. It's because it is a demonically inspired idea to stay 
with you and your class, with you and your group at the top of the heap. Okay? It happened to Jesus in the days of Herod whenever Herod went and killed all the babies. All it is is population control. Hello? Yeah. I mean, it's happened over and over. It happened in the early 1900s with a lady named Margaret Sanger. You may remember her. She was the founder of Planned Parenthood. But what did that do? Well, uh, she was a proponent of eugenics. And just recently, I mean, you know, in, in, in 1957, she was, uh, you know, a, a voted humanist of the year. In 1914, she had been uh, prosecuted by the federal government because her book on family limitations, it, 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 she was prosecuted under the Comstock Act of 1914. And then she rose in popularity because she was the one that was saying, we have to number, we have to lower the number of colored births in America. If we do not, and she founded Planned Parenthood. I mean, this is all in writing. I'm not making this up. This is history. In fact, so much so that just on July the 21st of this year, Planned Parenthood, in response to the questions about them uh, following the eugenics model, they took uh, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, and her name off of the building, and they disavowed any connection with her because you know they were having to answer. She's the one that popularized the term birth control. This is the book that she wrote that Hitler read and then went to on, 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 a, on a strategic effort to try to kill all the Jews and get rid of all the people that he thought was taking over his world. He thought that if they had more, if the Jews have more children, they're going to teach their children to, to be just like them, and we know how they are. They'll end up controlling all the finances of the whole world because that's the way they are. And so here's what we've got to do, and just exactly what the king of, of, of Egypt did, we have got to sell you know, the, the, this propaganda, our narrative, and we've got to create some hypothetical um, uh, you know, uh, scenarios and draw some conclusions so that it will scare the people in power so that we can keep these people from being born and, 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 and growing and encroaching. And I mean, this is, this, I mean, this is history. This is, on the 21st of July, this is what Planned Parenthood, this is their statement, okay? The removal of Margaret Sanger's name from our building is both a necessary and overdue step to reckon with our legacy and acknowledge Planned Parenthood's contribution to the historical reproductive harm within communities of color. They're saying this is what we have been doing since 1914. We have been controlling the population of colors, of, of communities of color and we, 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 we don't want to be seen like that anymore. But have you ever wondered why these abortion clinics that are free are put into only neighborhoods, mostly of color? I mean, this is from their own, this, this is a plan right out of Satan's plan book. The, and it's not new. The king of Egypt's plan for family limitation among the Israelites in that day was to cause reproductive harm. That was his goal. I need to cause reproductive harm in the community that I do not want them to grow and overpopulate. This is an ungodly, this, this, you know, this, this, this is such a demonic, we can see it in the book of Exodus, but can we see it in our own nation's history? It's, it's amazing. It's, 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 it's genocide. You're right. You know, uh, uh, he didn't just cause abortions, by the way. 
He didn't just mandate abortions and cause abortions and offer abortions. He didn't just do that. He also tried to degrade. We'll read this in a moment right out of Exodus. The king's strategy including degrading and debilitating the Hebrew male population by making their lives bitter and placing a greater hardship and putting them into bondage and making them work with rigor. That means somebody's behind them, beating them and making them work and making it harder on them. So that when they go home in the evenings, they don't even, they, I, mean, I mean, it's just not, it, it, the king, as I said, also fabricated hypothetical scenarios. He began to tell some of the other, he, he needed uh, uh, public support. He needed the midwives to buy into this. So how did he do that? He spread fear among his own people. He caused division between the races. This is a demonic attempt to keep a people down and to bring division. It was all a demonic attempt. And, and uh, uh, he... He created hypothetical scenarios. He said, well, what if we go to war and there's more of them than us and they side with our enemies? I mean, they could just kill us all. And he's instilling fear, creating hypothetical scenarios and drawing unrealistic conclusions, making the Egyptians afraid. The result, of course, was division. The result, of course, was, 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 was all of a sudden you have uh, one people against another people. You have a divided population. The king inspired fear in the lives of his subjects so that popular opinion would be on his side. I mean, I'm not, I could be reading this out of a newspaper today. In Exodus, Chapter one, let's begin with verse number seven. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph and he said to this people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we are. Come, let us deal shrewdly. Let, 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 the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, you know, Genesis says. Let us deal cunningly. Uh, you know, the, the, the King James Version says, let us deal wisely. This is a wisdom of the world. It's not God's wisdom. It's a worldly wisdom. It's a shrewdness. It's a strategic. Let, let, let's get behind the scenes and let's develop a strategy and let's deal shrewdly so that we, so, so no one will know what we're doing. Let's do this. Let's do it secretly and let's do it. Let's, let's make it sound good, look good, feel good, but let's accomplish our goal shrewdly. Let's deal shrewdly with them lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war. Here's this hypothetical scenario. By the way, don't answer hypothetical questions. Okay. It just plays in to, to who's, you know, uh, who, whoever's narrative, whatever, uh, just, just, uh, you know, Jesus didn't. Jesus just refused to answer hypothetical questions. You know, he did answer the real ones though. Okay. Let's deal shrewdly, lest they multiply. And it happen in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us. And so go up uh, uh, out of the land. Uh, you know, his real goal was, I don't want to lose my slaves. I don't want to lose my free labor. So what did they do? Well, he began by setting taskmasters over them. You can read you know, what verse 11 says. And he began to afflict them with heavy burdens. And, and, and so he, he, he made them build cities for him. Verse 12, I love this. One of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible. But the more uh, the, the Egyptians afflicted the Israelites, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew and, the, and they were in dread of the children of Israel. I like that, you know. And so what they do? The king led the Egyptians to go ahead and, 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 and make them serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter, verse 14 says. And, and uh, you know, and verse 15, you know, uh, uh, the, 
the king spoke to the midwives and said, this is what you got to do. You know, uh, verse 16, you know, uh, uh, w- w- when you see the, 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 the Hebrew women about to bring forth children, you know, uh, kill them, kill the children. If it's a son, you kill him. If it's a daughter, then let them live. We can use the women, you know, we're not really afraid of the women, but the men kill them, kill the babies. Why kill the babies? You kill the babies. You destroy the hope of a people. You destroy the hope of a family. You destroy the future. You take away the kids. You take away the future. Whether you take them away in indoctrination or whether you take them away physically, whenever you rob a family, a community, whenever you destabilize a family, whenever you come in and divide a family, whenever you destabilize the nuclear family, you destroy the future. And that is the goal of Satan. That's not the goal of God. And it's not the goal of any sane government or any sane person. Herod tried this with Jesus, destroy the family, destroy the future, destroy the children. They are the future. Control the children, control the future. Indoctrinate the kids, change the future. Teach the children something not true and the future will be a reflection of what you have taught. But you know, the Bible says in verse 17, the midwives feared God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Let me tell you something. In every generation, God has people. In every situation, God has people. Never fear, never doubt. God has people in every group. There are people that fear the Lord. In every generation, in every circumstance, in every situation, you will find people that will stand up for what is right and righteous and refuse to go along with the mandates of the king whenever he is evidently possessed by the devil. Hey, this is good stuff. (laughs) Glory to God. God has people everywhere. Bible says in verse 17 that they did not obey the king but they saved these little boys alive wow and you know if you were to read verses 18 through 21 you would find out that God blessed those midwives even though the king got on to him and everything, the Bible says that God even made them houses. I mean, in, in every situation, no matter where you are, no matter what color you are, no matter what race, culture, creed, it makes no difference what ethnos we are. God has people and he blesses people who fear him and obey him above the dictates and the mandates of the population and the popular opinion of the time. We ride above the zeitgeist. Well, so uh, at any rate, we get to Exodus chapter 2. And we, now we get to the Bible character. That's where Joshebed and Amram were in life. They were a part of the underprivileged class. They were a part of the slave labor of Egypt. They were under the mandate of the king. First of all, like China, you know, you can't have the kids. Don't you better not. And if you do, if you, if you dare to have a kid, we're going to kill it. You know, in China, it was, it, it, it was, you know, basically kill the girls because Male children are of value in China. But for the last generation, if you, if, if, you know, you can only have one, they, they, had, they had the one child law. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, uh, so if a family knew, the pressure was on them. And if a family knew that they were having a girl, they would abort the girl or kill the girl at birth. That way they could have another one. And so here we end up a generation later today, today in China, Never before in the history of China has there been such mass depression and suicide. 
Why? Because there's a whole generation of 20 something, 30 something year old men and there are no women. And there's no, there, 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 there's no motivation for the young man to go out and get an education. No motivation for the young man to go out and excel or do well because he can never get married because there are no girls. He can never have a family. Why in the world would we want, he, he want to work his, his life long for nothing? This is one of the reasons why Bible scholars for, for a long period of time believe that, that one day China will march in war and motivated by capturing another culture and another people just to feed the desire of their young men to have a woman. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, well, at any rate. The players, Amram, the dad, Joshebed, the mom, Miriam, the older sister, and Moses, the little baby. Are you ready? In verse number one, and a man of the house of Levi went and took a wife anyway. She was a daughter of Levi. That means she was from the tribe of Levi. So the woman conceived anyway and bore a son anyway. And when she saw that the child was beautiful, I'm glad he's a good looking child. He'd been ugly. I guess she let him go. I don't know. <laughs> you know, that song has always confused me. You know? What, what, what is that? Uh, uh, huh? Yeah. Because you're beautiful. What is it? Uh, I've got to think about it now. What, what is that song? Uh, loving you is easy because you're beautiful. Who in the world? I mean, come on now. Loving you would be horrible if you weren't gorgeous. Because you're just not the girl of my dreams. Except your skin looks nice. La, 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 la. Who would sing a song like that? Where did that come from? That dude should have been slapped. <laughs> okay, I'll move on. It's just like, whew. Okay, so, so she hid Moses for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes, a basket, for him, and she daubed it with, uh, with asphalt and with pitch and, uh, you know, like with tar. And she put him in it and uh, laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister Miriam stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Now, you, you, you hopefully know the rest of the story. If not, you can read the rest of the story. It's, it, it's only about five more verses or, or, or you know, uh, um, and um, six more verses maybe. And, uh, you know, she pushed him out. And as he floated out there, wouldn't you know, it wasn't coincidence. God knows everything. God's got his hand. God's even got his hand in everything that's going on in America today. Nothing happens of this magnitude that God is not right in the middle of it. In fact, I really do believe that God is healing our nation. I believe he, he's responding to our prayer. And it's just sometimes difficult to clean a mess up. But I'm not a bit afraid or concerned because I know God's right in the middle of it. And he has heard our prayer. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their lands. This is a part of a healing. I know it may not look like it, may not feel like it, but I know my God will never leave us nor forsake us. And in our arm, not short. And he wasn't joking when he said if we would pray and humble ourselves and call upon him. And we have as a nation and we're still doing it. People all over. And for years we've, you know, good five years we've been doing it I am convinced that almighty God is cleaning up a mess in our nation glory to God hallelujah anyway that's another message okay so here came Pharaoh's daughter by the way God's not doing it like I would have done it aren't you glad I'm not God Whew. so here comes Pharaoh's daughter and she's going to bathe and she sees that and she says to her servant, go over there and get that. What is, and bring it. And it's the baby. She looks, oh, and I mean, God, it's a little Hebrew boy. And her heart just went, oh, reckon who made her fall in love with that little Hebrew boy. Hmm? She's the daughter of Pharaoh, the king. 
that's saying we got to kill these kids. Miriam was there along the bank of the river and she said, hey, hey, little Hebrew girl, come here. The Hebrew girl says, look, do you need me to help you? You need me to find a nursemaid for, for this little boy? Yeah. So she went back and got her mama, Moses' mama, her mama, brought her back and said, this woman will take care of him. Okay. Pharaoh's daughter said, not only, you know, take him home with you and you raise him and take care of him, but you remember he belongs to me. Okay. And here, here's all the money you need to raise him. A <laughs> pretty good deal, huh? She raised him up. And then she brought him when he was, uh, you know, older. She brought him there to, um, to Pharaoh's daughter. And uh, he became, you know, Moses, the one that was drawn out of the water. Is what that means. The son of the daughter of Pharaoh. Wow. Well, let me cut to the chase and give you three things as, uh, as, as we are closing tonight. Three things I've learned from this lady, Joshebed. All right. Now, I realize she was in a very difficult situation, okay? But, Joshua, she saw a future when others had no hope. I want to be like her. I want to be like her. I want to live a life of any way. You know, of trusting. You know, she, I, I want to live a life of seeing a future. When it, when it is bad, when things, aren't, when, when things are difficult in our nation, when there's political division and racial tension and, 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 and injustice and hurt and pain and, and slandering and maligning and all the other things, you know, I want to see a future. I want to be the person that sees a future, even when others do not. I want to make sure that I have hope. She conceived a child anyway. You know, she just didn't go with the status quo. She saw a future. And that's why she hid that little boy. She had hope. She didn't lose her hope because everything around her. Can you imagine how chaotic it was? Look, we, we, we can see in our nation the trouble. But you know, the, the trouble is not just, I mean, I mean, it's not running at me trying to, try, to, trying to you know, kill my kids or it's not right now. I mean, uh, you're, under, you're, you're not having to hide right now. Moses was supposed to be aborted. Okay? That was what the world had for him. God had something different. She had hope. She had hope. Okay. Number two, uh, one of the things I love about Joshua Beth is she did all she could for as long as she could. She did all she could for as long as she could. She did all she could. She protected her child for as long as she could. She did all she could for as long as she could. She, she took what she had. She started where she was and she just did the very best she could. That's the way I want to be. I want to do everything I can for as long as I can. I, even in the midst of trouble and trial, you know, I want to be the kind of person, I want to be the person that did all I could do for as long as I could do it. If it fails, I don't want it to be on my watch. If it, if it falls and tears up, I don't want to be the one that, I want to do all I can for what is right and righteous. You know, I, I want to be the person that has hope in the midst of trouble and have a, you know, see future when other people can't see any future and have no hope for the future. And I want to do all, I want to do my part. Nobody else can do my part. Nobody else could do her part. I want to do all I can for as long as I can. She's encouraged me to be that kind of person. And the third thing, she trusted God with her greatest treasure. Do you know how difficult it is uh, if you're a parent? You do, you know, to do all you can for as long as you can for your child, to prepare everything you can for your child as she prepared a basket and did everything she could. She did all she could for as long as she could, but she also knew when it was time for God to take over. And when she put him in that basket, and let him, pushed him out beyond her reach. That's where she trusted God. We have to trust God 
with our greatest treasure, even when it means that we have to release it to him beyond our reach. Whether it's how important, you know, a friend is, but you have to trust them in God's hands or a family member or a circumstance or a situation. You have to be willing to trust it to God. Many times whenever we take our hands off of it, God really gets to fully get his hands on it. She prepared the ark to the saving of her household just like Noah did. But then she pushed Moses into the hands of God. She let him go. He had a destiny beyond her ability to control it, to manipulate it, to make it happen. She had to trust her child as he went off into the rivers of this world. And we never imagine that our children can take care of themselves. We never imagine that our friends can do without us. But God, when we let them go, God takes them. Whatever the situation, you can trust God with your greatest treasure. Pastor Wayne Ozio, one of our elders, is going to come now and he's going to lead us in corporate prayer tonight. Open your heart up. Let's pray together for the heart and the soul of our nation. Our nation needs help. Okay? And God has chosen to move on behalf of of his children when we pray. Pastor Wayne, thank you. Well, Lord, we come to you tonight. We lift up our nation. Lord, with all this going on, Lord, we don't go by what we see. Lord, we go by what your word says, Lord. That no weapon formed against our nation is going to prosper in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father God, that every tongue that rises against us will fall in Jesus' name. But Lord, we put our trust in you, Lord. Your hand is strong. We don't war against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rules of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. And Father, the name above all names, Jesus Christ, every knee we shall bow. And I thank you, Father God, that we trust you and we just thank you, Father God, that you're healing our nation tonight. And we just thank you for what you're doing and we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. And, and amen. Thank you, Brother Wayne. God bless you, sir. Amen, amen, amen. For those of you that are at home or watching perhaps on your phone in some other setting or maybe somewhere around the world, perhaps you're on the African continent, maybe, uh, you know, in India, uh, Eastern Europe, you know, uh, Indonesia, one of the islands. You know, we know that God has a plan. We believe with all of our heart that he will succeed. And we also believe that he gives us a chance to participate. Let me encourage you. you know, uh, have hope. Have hope when others around you do not. Believe in a better day. You know, and make sure as well that you follow Joshebed's lead. That you do all you can for as long as you can. And then you trust God with things you can't do anything about. You have to give your trust to God. Okay. Well, I love you. And make sure as well that if you have any prayer request, that you go on to cotr.com, all right? And there you can find a place, cotr, that stands for Church on the Rock, cotr.com. You'll find an opportunity, you'll scroll down to connect with us. And there you can leave a prayer request. And if you're not sure you're born again, or if you're not even sure about what it means, if you will find that place on that website, in the resources, there is a message of salvation. I believe it's there in 10 different languages, okay? 
Uh, in fact, let me encourage you, just go and listen to a few of them. Listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ in, uh, you know, being portrayed in some other language and imagine that people all over the world are being born again right now. Okay? God bless you. I love you. Okay? Uh, if you need anything, let us know. And we'll see you right back here at 11 a.m. Texas time this Sunday morning for a word from God. God bless. Amen. Amen. This program is brought to you through the faithful support of the members and partners of Golden Triangle Church on the Rock. For more information about our church or to find other programming and additional resources, check out our website at www.cotr.com. Join us here next time. And until then, we pray God blesses you to make a living, make a life, and make a difference.